Ham says none. Uh, nobody gets the joke. Okay, well, that's, that's the best joke I have for this morning. Yeah. Nobody shopped at Sam's Club. Oh, it's no longer here. If you had a card, <laughs> it's good to scrape the windows on the first day at Frost. I think we talked about that l- last week. That If you have to explain a joke, it's not a joke. Yeah. <laughs> Anymore, but I'm glad you're here today. Our purpose uh, in gathering is to open the Bible and to find something that was written there a long time ago. But it, uh, you know, just because something is written a long time ago, just because something has been around for a long time, does not mean that it is not meaningful. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, there are some things that are enduring, that are permanent, that are meaningful in whatever age that they're written. And the words that we're about to read were written about 2,000 years ago. And I think you'll find that they are as helpful and as pertinent in today's time as they were uh, back then. We're going through the study of Hebrews, and if you would join me in prayer, we'll ask God to come and and be our teacher. Our Father in heaven, as we open up this uh, passage in the book of Hebrews, we ask that you come open our eyes to its meaning, to what it has meant from the first time that it was penned up until today. Pray that you'll open our eyes to how to apply it in our day and time and that you'll see our place in this great work that you're doing in the world. Open our eyes to see Jesus. Come and be our teacher. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, today we're going to be uh, hopefully hopefully getting to Hebrews chapter 7, and we have a lot of territory to cover. My goal by the end of this is really just to introduce you to a person that you will meet in Scripture two times in the Old Testament, and then here in Hebrews you'll meet kind of in, in a tantalizing way multiple times. Uh, his name is Melchizedek. And so I want to introduce you to who this person was, what his place is in the whole story, and how he, like many of the other people that you meet in Scripture, is pointing towards uh, this man, Jesus, and trying to open your eyes to who this really is. Now, the book of Hebrews, you remember, was written about 50 to 70 A.D., so again, almost 2,000 years ago, We don't know who the author was, could have been multiple people, but the letters were circulated with the same, or excuse me, the book of Hebrews was circulated with the letters that were written by Paul, same letters that would have some of them written by Peter and John, that collection of letters that went around to the early churches. This particular letter of Hebrews was probably written to Christians living in Rome. So imagine the city of Rome 2,000 years ago, this is if, uh, for those of you in Uh, you know, the junior high years and maybe even high school when you start to study the Roman Empire. This is the period of time that we tend to teach uh, about Rome. This was the glory days of Rome. And that's when this letter was written to a group of people, not unlike yourselves, who had gathered in a major city uh, to learn about God, to worship God, to encourage each other. Uh, But this was not a group of people who were popular at the time. To be a Christian in Rome was a dangerous thing. Uh, To be a Jewish Christian in Rome was even more of a dangerous thing. And and as we've talked about in previous weeks, the emperor at the time was probably Nero, a megalomaniac, narcissistic leader who thought mostly of himself. And if anybody opposed him or his leadership, uh, he would find ways to make sure they were either executed, run off, or burnt out of the city. And so this was a dangerous time to live. And so you can imagine being a group of people who are unpopular, who have a faith that others are questioning, living in a city that offers many different gods and many other political views. And to to wonder, is this real? What I do every single week, going through those cycles that any Jewish person or any Gentile who has become a Christian would have been doing, going through these cycles week after week, is this real? And so you have this letter that is written to this group of people in Rome to say, this is not only real, this is the only hope for the whole world. What you're hanging on to is worth hanging on to with all your might. You're going to see the word today. First time we know that it's used in in all of Christianity is what you have is an anchor for your soul. Don't give up. And so the main purpose of the book of Hebrews is to encourage Christians as read when we finally get to chapter 10 don't give up your confidence don't throw that away it's worth it you're hanging on to the only real thing in the entire universe 
So just as way of, uh, a way of review and leading up to the main topic for today, I want to remind you of that very first paragraph in the book of Hebrews. As you're reading through Hebrews, remember, this is a letter. It was meant to be read from the first word all the way to the end without stopping. Just like if you picked up a letter from a friend or you received a letter from a family member, no fair just reading the first paragraph and putting it away for later. You know, you, you read the whole email. You read the whole message. Um, with Hebrews, as you're reading through this message, if you ever get lost or wonder what is he trying to say here, you can always go back to the first paragraph and it gives you the outline uh, for the whole book. And that outline is this. A long time ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He, talking about Jesus here, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of God's nature. And he upholds or he lifts up everything, the universe, by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, and this is the part we'll focus on mostly in the next few weeks, is how is it that God solves the world's greatest problem? The world's greatest problem, if all of the world's greatest problems, if you go back to the root, if the worst problem is evil, how is it that the God of all creation takes care of evil uh, in the world? And after finding out that, then after making purification for sins, we'll find out that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So that's a king's position. What he's saying here is that Jesus is king. So after taking care of the world's greatest problem, Jesus becomes king, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent uh, than theirs. So that's the introduction, and that's the outline of the book. Now, just as a reminder here, we were introduced to this idea of Jesus being greater than angels. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than uh, the law itself. Jesus is incredible. So put him right up there, and you say, well, how incredible is he? Put him right up there next to God. And if you lived in the first century, and you lived in a city where a megalomaniac, narcissistic emperor <laughs> says, I am it. I am the son of God as a part of the imperial, imperial cult. There would have been a worship of the emperor. If you live in that kind of society, and somebody comes in and says, actually, somebody else sits right next to God. <laughs> That's a powerful statement. It's a, those, are, those are fighting words in Rome. But what the writer is saying is the same thing that everyone who has followed the story from the time that God first called Abraham, everyone who's followed that story has recognized that there's a Messiah coming who will be, in their terminology, king. He will be the emperor. He is the, the leader of the universe. And he is the one who sits down at the right hand of God. And I think most of us would say, okay, we can understand that terminology, and we would we would put Jesus in that place. He is in a kingly uh, you know, position, a royal position. But we run into a problem if we are good students of Scripture, if we also say that he is a priest. Let me see if I can explain this. In, in the Hebrew Scriptures, so you go through your Old Testament, there is a separation of church and state. And that is that the, the kings of Israel all come from the line of Judah and the Messiah is to come from the line of Judah but no one in the line of Judah is allowed to walk into the temple and offer sacrifices and certainly no one from the line of Judah is allowed to walk through that holy place behind the curtain into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant sat no one from the line of Judah is allowed behind that curtain to to meet with God the only one who is allowed to go behind that curtain is someone who is the high priest and who is in the line of Levi, a totally different family line. And so there is in uh, the Hebrew scriptures, there is this separation of those who lead the country as king from those who uh, lead the worship in terms of the temple. Does that separation make sense? Because if it does, then you'll say, okay, I see a problem the writer of Hebrews is going to run into if he tries to tell us Jesus is king, and we say, yes. And then in the next line, he says, Jesus is also our priest. And we'll say, no fair, because Jesus comes from the line of Judah. It makes sense. Actually, David, the king, 
was his great 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 grandfather right in the human line uh, uh, lineage uh, it makes sense that Jesus would be king it doesn't quite make sense that he's a priest and so we have to solve this problem how is it that Jesus can be the priest so that brings us to chapter 4 when the writer says since then we have this great high priest talking about Jesus who has passed through the heavens Jesus the Son of God let us hold fast to our confession for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we, but one, we have one who in every respect has been tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then uh, with confidence draw near the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So you have a priest, Jesus, who understands what it means to be human. And he is the one who goes into the real temple, who goes into heaven on your behalf. But we still have this problem. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. Now this leads to a question. Because it's the priest's job, look there in the second part of that sentence, it's the priest's job to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward. <laughs> Don't you like the way he calls us? Uh, since he himself is beset with weaknesses. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sin, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. Aaron, this is the start of the line of priests that come from Levi. And everybody knows that that's what priests have done from the beginning. The job of a priest, and certainly the high priest, is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to petition God on behalf of the people. Well, we're entering an election season uh, now. In the next month, you'll be deciding who is going to be your governor, who is going to be uh, your representatives, uh, maybe your senator, maybe vote on a few uh, referendums or amendments or uh, new laws for the state. We go into this voting season, and we all treasure this right that we have in the U.S. of being able to walk into a voting booth and, and put down our vote. And we serve not a pure democracy, as you remember from civics class, we serve in a republic. It's a representative form of government. And so when you vote for someone, you are saying, I, w w I am asking you, I am commissioning you to go to Juno, in this case, on my behalf and speak on my behalf to solve the greatest problems in our state. And we have many problems in our state. We have budget issues. We have problems with crime. There's problems with education. Uh, there's problems with how you're going to pay to solve those problems if you don't have uh, the, uh, if you're not getting the same amount of money for the oil that we did at one time in the past or other forms of income. So we have all of these problems that have to be weighed together. And we want someone to go on our behalf to help solve these problems. Same thing we do on national elections. We understand this idea of somebody speaking on our behalf. Now that's in a small way what it was like for the priest to walk into the temple and to petition God with sacrifices, with prayers, to petition God on behalf of the people to solve the world's greatest problems. But these priests were not elected by the people. They served because they were appointed. They were part of the line that came down through the uh, family line of Levi. And so they were appointed to go in and speak on behalf of the people. So now think about the world's greatest problems. If you were to pick them or pick out a few on one hand, you would probably recognize that all of the evil in the world, every form of suffering in the world, comes down to one of probably five different things. Things like uh, malnutrition. Uh, things like homelessness. By that I mean displacement. Things like injustice. Things like uh, pestilence or illness, you know, or uh, epidemics. Uh, the, these, are the world's, these are the world's greatest problems. And when you, when you trace the root of all, or trace all of those problems to their root, what you find is the cause of the world's greatest problems is evil in the heart of people. And so if that is our greatest problem, if our greatest problem is evil, if it is sin, how do you solve the world's greatest problem? We need someone who can petition God on our behalf. So imagine for a minute that you were able to elect someone to go into heaven on your behalf. Now think about this. What living person, so pick a living person, what living person would you elect to go before God and speak on behalf 
or petition God on behalf of the world. What living person would you choose? I know it's Bible class, so no fair (laughs) picking an obvious religious answer. I want you to think of a living person, a living person who you would elect to petition God on behalf of the entire world. And who would you elect? If, if that's how we selected people, who would you pick? Uh, the writer of Hebrews is going to give you his answer. Now that you know what a priest does, so also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest. In other words, he didn't run for office. Uh, he is not there because his parents were priests, because Joseph was a priest, or because his great-grandfather or great-great-great-grandfather was a priest. His great-great-great-great-grandfather was a king. He was on a different line. Christ did not exalt himself to be made high priest, but he was appointed by him, meaning God, who said to him, you are my son. God appointed him to be the high priest. And he also says in another place, and all of this comes from Psalm chapter 110, And so there are two places in the Old Testament where you're going to run into this name, Melchizedek. One of those is in Genesis. The other is in Psalms. Only two places. But here, in a tantalizing way, the writer of Hebrews slips it in, and he says in Psalm, you know know the passage, he says, you are a priest forever, eternally, after the order of Melchizedek. Well, who is this guy, Melchizedek? In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So you see again, I'm, I'm actually skipping some verses here, but just to show you that this name keeps popping up, but he never tells you who he is. He just says Jesus is appointed in the same order, the same taxonomy, or in the same, he doesn't mean that he's in the family line. He's saying he's the same type of priest as Melchizedek. So who is this guy? We skip to uh, 5 verse 11. About this time, or excuse me, uh, about this, meaning Melchizedek and his priesthood, we have much to say, but it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you. Again, the basic principles and the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Let us, therefore, leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity. So you remember we talked uh, last week about how there are some elementary, foundational teachings in Christianity. When you first are deciding, are you going to follow Christ, and you make that decision to say, this is real, this is the only thing that leads to uh, solving not only the world's greatest problems, but my greatest problems, there are about six things that it's worth learning and learning well. These are the ABCs of Christianity. The first of those is repentance from dead works. The second would be faith towards God. The third would be instruction about washings. The word there is baptism, so learning about baptism. The next is the laying on of hands, the giving of authority, or perhaps the giving of the Holy Spirit. The resurrection of the dead, and then finally eternal judgment. And so he says these are your ABCs. If you are Uh, new at following Christ, or if any of these are things that you haven't thought about in a long time, he's saying these are elementary. And you remember the writer of Hebrews says, we're not going to spend a lot of time on these. In fact, he says, let's just set these aside, not meaning putting them away. He said, let's just put those right here because we all know these basic principles. But using the same metaphor he just used, he's saying, this is milk. This is just, this is basics. Make sure you understand this. But I want to tell you something that is for the mature. I'm about to take you into territory that unless you've got the elementary principles down, it's not going to make any sense. But he says, I'm assuming that the readers of this book have already got down these basic principles of repentance and faith and baptism and laying on of hands and uh, repentance and uh, resurrection and then eternal judgment. He says, this, these are the basics. I'm assuming you've got that because if you do, then you may be ready for us to take this up to a level that's really for the mature, for those who are ready to think about what God is really doing to solve the world's greatest problem. 
And this we will do if God permits. And we desire, he says in verse 11 of chapter 6, that each one of you should show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit. And I put this in here just to show you the word, inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, God swore by himself. Uh, There's a... uh, a phrase that I, I don't use lightly here, but people, if they really want you to, to understand that what they're saying is absolutely true, they will say, I swear to, and then they'll put in God's name. It's a way of saying, I have no, and I know a lot of times people will flippantly use that without thinking about what it means. But the phrase is meant to say, there is no higher authority by which I can swear. Well, what do you do if you're God? And say, it's really true. And, and the writer of Hebrews says, he has no one higher to swear by. So who do you swear by? He, swear, he swears by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, one of those is God's promise and the other is God's oath. Um, We won't get into this too deeply, but just the the difference between those two is a promise, according to the word that is used here, simply means stating what is true right now versus an oath, which is, stating what is true about what is to come, or a future promise. Those are two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Because of that, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast, and here's the word I mentioned earlier, we have, first time used in any Christian writings, as far as we know, that God is an anchor, or or excuse me, the promise that he made is an anchor for our soul, And it's a hope, and don't miss this, it's a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. You're meant to hear that, not just as a curtain, you know, as a window. This is talking about the temple in which there was a holy place, but then there was a curtain. And it separated the holy place from the most holy place. And those who followed this from the beginning of the story recognize that what was behind that curtain is the most holy holy place in all the earth because that is where God met with man and so the writer of Hebrews is taking you behind that curtain and said that's where your anchor so you think of an anchor this word anchor means the same thing then as it does today think of a ship even a large ship out you know in port with an anchor thrown out that anchor is holding that ship in place and he's saying you have an anchor your anchor is thrown out you follow that line all the way in and that anchor is secured behind the curtain somebody took it there and anchored it in and that's where your that's where your hope is and that's where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf having become a high priest forever after the order of and there's his name again Melchizedek who is this guy Melchizedek well it's time for us to go back to Genesis chapter 14 now what I'm giving you are a few little anchors if you will or hooks on which to go back and read about Melchizedek and when you read through Hebrews I want you to be able just to recognize some names to not feel lost but rather feel that you're among friends as you see these names pop up but the story in Genesis chapter 14 begins with Abraham he's actually called Abram at the time God has not changed his name he has called him but the promises haven't been made yet Isaac hasn't been born uh, the uh, uh, the uh, you know the, the uh, Abraham is married to Sarah at this time they uh, uh, they have uh, made their way through Egypt they've come back to uh, Israel and and there there is this relationship between Abram and Lot and Abraham and Lot have to separate because their their shepherds are arguing over whose land is what and where they're going to uh, each sort of set up their not just their camp but their entire estates 
And so they end up splitting, and Abram does this really nice thing, and lets Lot pick, you know, the, the greener pastures. And so Lot goes over, and he actually settles in the city of Sodom, which you'll later hear about, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot, uh, living there in Sodom, just sort of mixes with the people. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah become evil places, you know, to live. Uh, and we learn about that later. But Abram lives across the river, if you will, kind of on the east side and sets up his estate. All of that to say this, that these aren't the only people in the world. There are other kings and kingdoms and peoples that live all the way around, and they're constantly fighting with each other. And it, it just so happened that there were five kings, or actually four kings, that had joined forces, and these other five kings had to pay them tribute. And one of those was Bera, the king of Sodom. And Sodom had to, uh, you know, give tribute to Kaolatomer was the name of the king. Uh, but they decided one day, we're not going to serve you anymore. Well, those are fighting words, and so they ended up fighting. So there was this big battle between the four kings and the five kings, and it turns out the four bigger kings beat up on the five lesser kings, and, and one of those lesser kings was the king of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so the uh, Kaolatomer came and he took over the entire city of Sodom. This is the point of telling you the whole story, is that Lot was captured. I don't think Lot was actually in the battle itself, but he lived in the territory, he lived in the region, and so he and his family were all captured, and they were taken into captivity. Well, word reached Abram that his nephew had been captured, and so Abram mustered his forces. It was over 300 people that he pulled together, and they all went and attacked these foreign uh, kings, and they rescued Lot, brought him back. And not only rescued Lot, they also rescued the king of Sodom and Gomorrah and all these other kings, as well as all of the booty, if you will, that had been taken off. So they brought back, you know, incredible amounts of supplies. And that's where this story comes in, where Abram comes back. He has all of this wealth brought back for the king of Sodom. The king of Sodom comes out basically in a ritualistic or, or excuse me, an official way to say, thank you very much <laughs> for rescuing us and rescuing Lot and the king is going to offer Abram everything. You can have it all, you know, or whatever you want. And Abram says, no, I don't want anybody to say that I am wealthy because of the king of Sodom. He actually backs away from that. And so that's where this story comes in with when uh, the king of Sodom comes up. And then we're told that after this, after the defeat of Kaolatomer, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of uh, Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And then this is where the passage comes in. And Melchizedek, there's his name, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine because he was priest of God most high. So Melchizedek comes out. Now Melchizedek is not the king of Sodom or Gomorrah or any of the other countries that were in this battle. He's a king who lives we think, and we find from other places, that he was the king over a place called Salem. The word Salem means peace. It comes from the word shalom. And you still hear the word that's used in that same city, in that same place, the city of shalom, or the city of peace, called Jerusalem, or Jerusalem. And so Melchizedek was the king uh, of Salem, or what would now be Jerusalem, and he was the king most high. And he brings out... For Abraham and all of his army, bread and wine, acting the role of the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him, and he said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him, so Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. And at that point, then the story shifts back to the uh, king of Sodom saying, okay, I will give you, you know, payment for coming to rescue us. And Abram backs away and says, I have everything I need. And he gives it all back. The only tribute that is given at all was the tenth of all the spoils. A tenth of that was given to Melchizedek at this time when Melchizedek, in a priestly way, brought out bread, and you're meant to hear this, bread and wine as the high priest of God. And then he walks off the stage, and we don't see him anymore. Uh, isn't, uh, and, and he disappears until Psalm 110, when the writer of Psalms brings him back into the story and says that Melchizedek, again, is a priest of God Most High, and he's a priest forever. 
And then we don't hear about him again until in Hebrews. But now you, this, now you know the story where the writer of Hebrews is trying to bring back to mind. And, you, and it's right to say, well, what does that mean to me? Now, this would have meant a lot to people who had studied these scriptures from the time they were young. Because over time, the story of Melchizedek grew. And Melchizedek was seen as an example or a metaphor or in some way an illustration of this Messiah that they were expecting to come. One who would be both a priest of God Most High and a king. And he is the one who would come and rescue the people. And he would uh, be the, the one who would provide, and they would use this term, provide atonement for the people. And so these are the stories that would have been told throughout their writings. And that's what's on the mind of the writer of Hebrews when he's trying to reach for an example to say, Jesus is your king, but he's also a high priest. And he's trying to find an example to connect to. And so he takes us all the way back to this original story. Now let's see how he brings it into Hebrews. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and he blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. You just read that story. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. Now, the he here is Melchizedek, is first of all, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. The writer of Hebrews knows that you probably don't speak Hebrew. Seems ironic there. He's writing to Jewish people, but these, uh, the people of that time primarily spoke Greek. And so he's writing in Greek. He writes this term Melchizedek, which is actually a Hebrew name. And he says the name itself means Melche, king of Zedek, which is righteousness. It means king of righteousness. And he is also king of, as I said earlier, Salem, which comes from the word shalom or complete or total or peace. But that peace there meaning more than just absence of war, but rather real peace, where everything is right. He is the king of peace. So you notice he's two things there, the king of righteousness, the king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy. And the better translation there is just to say that in, the, in his history, he is fatherless, motherless, and has no genealogy. So there's no way you can trace where he came from in terms of being a priest or a king or the children who came after him. He's not saying here that uh, he, he came into this world by immaculate conception or that he was, uh, you know, that was born of a virgin or anything. I mean, it's not that kind of connection. He's just saying, you don't know where he came from or where he went. You have no idea. Uh, because in the story, he's fatherless, uh, motherless, has no genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor the end of life, but resembling the Son of God. And here's that resembling. So as a metaphor for the Son of God, Melchizedek continues as a priest forever. He stays in our mind. He stays in our thought. He stays in our story forever. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, that's what I'm trying to tell you about Jesus. Is he, in reality, is without human mother, father, genealogy, in terms of his priesthood. He is not a priest because he's connected in some family line to the Levites. He's not king because he's in some family line to David. He is... He is your priest and your king forever. He's trying to get that point across to you. See how great this man was? Now he's taking you back to Melchizedek. To whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people. So if you lived in Israel, you had to pay a tenth that went into the temple treasury uh, as a part of the, the law. That is, from their brothers, they take this money, though these are all descended from Abraham. But this man, Melchizedek, who does not have his descendants from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. Uh, and he's just saying it's common sense that if, if someone... Uh, gives a blessing, the assumption is the one giving the blessing is superior to the one who receives the blessing. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men. He's talking about the temple. But in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. Word here, Zoe, that he exists, that he... So the contrast there is 
in Israel for the temple and because and for the, the worship of God through the Levite priest, we were, would have been required to give a tenth. And that was for a human institution or for uh, worship, uh, you know, that is led by people who do not live. But this other one is a tenth. And he's again bringing to mind the story of Melchizedek. A tenth was given by Abraham to someone who still exists. And you're meant in your mind to pull that together with the story of Jesus. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. We don't have time to jump into this too far, but I'm always amazed when you're reading through Scripture and you run across a good understanding of the things that we like to say we just discovered in our generation or since the Enlightenment. Uh, you know, certain scientific uh, principles you know, have come to be fully understood. And you read something from an ancient text that shows that, no, they pretty well had it figured out where babies come from and how they're connected. And, and this line of genealogy that Levi, hundreds of years later, is connected to Abraham. And he is in Abraham. To me, that's a fascinating thought that you really don't pick up until you're studying genealogy and uh, microbiology and embryology and genetics that there's, there's an understanding of that. Maybe not to the depth, certainly not to the depth that we have nowadays. Um, but he's using that to make an argument to people. Now, you don't use an argument unless the people have a good understanding of what it is you're talking about. And everybody would have nodded and said, yes, we fully understand that I in some way was present in my great, 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 great grandparents. And the writer of Hebrews uses that to say, in a sense, he says, I'm only speaking figuratively here, but in a sense, Levi, the leader of all the priests of Israel, is the one who walked up to Melchizedek and handed him a tenth. So even though we would have been paying our tenth to this group of Levites, the Levites actually gave the tithe to Melchizedek. That's the point he's trying to make. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it, the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Again, Aaron led to the priest that you read about in the Old Testament. Melchizedek is this other uh, priesthood. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. And here he's talking about Jesus again. For the one that we're talking about, the, the one in Hebrews chapter 1, who is the final word, the one who upholds everything by his power, the exact radiance and the imprint of God himself, the one we are talking about, is one who came from another tribe, not the tribe of Levi, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. So now I've brought you back to where we were at the first when I said the writer of Hebrews is helping you solve a problem. Now, 2,000 years later, you would say, I have no idea who Melchizedek was. I didn't really care who came from the line of Judah, who came from the line of Levi. That's never really been something that affected my daily work. Uh, I understand the separation of church and state, but in a totally different era, and, and there, it means something totally different today. So, that, you know, you rightfully would read this and go, what, what does that really have to do with me? But here's where the writer of Hebrews brings everybody back together in the next passage. Here in chapter 7, verse 15, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek. So again, just like those people who read this for the first, you now have a picture in your mind of who Melchizedek was, the type of priest that he was, and how he was somebody that God was using and working with and through and communicating with outside of this line of people that he was following that came from Abraham. So maybe just one other quick point before we read this passage, and that's this. You understand that though in Scripture you're following really one family line. It starts broadly with uh, Adam and Eve. It gets narrow, uh, you know, or uh, narrow suddenly at the flood, and then it spreads out again, you know. Um, but God is not only following, as you follow the story through the line of Abraham, 
God is also doing work throughout the world in these other cultures that are developing from the sons that came from Noah. And remember, it's all of these. In fact, some of the sons of Noah were still alive at the time that Melchizedek was given this gift by Abraham. So you still have these cultures all over the world that God is working through. And he goes on to say that, uh, again, this, this likeness of Melchizedek, who has become priest, not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. He lives forever. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's what is written in Psalms. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. That's talking about the Old Testament law. Not that it's bad, but now there's something better. You remember the enemy of good is not bad, but better. He's saying, I've got something that's coming that's better. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope, there's that word better, is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made uh, a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost, or save to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself up for the law appointed men in their weaknesses, excuse me, in their weaknesses, high priest. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Now, I give that to you as a hook to say it's worth going back and reading Hebrews. Start and just get through chapter 7. And now Melchizedek is in your mind, and I leave you with this question. If you had to elect one living person who could go into the heavens and speak to God and petition God on behalf of the greatest problems in the world, who would you elect? And the writer of Hebrews says, let me remind you the only living person who can do that for you, and it's Jesus. Even today, don't forget, Jesus is not, as one t-shirt says, Jesus is my favorite dead guy. When I saw that, ten people, people tend to want to be offended. I, I just smiled because you recognize he's not dead. He's not dead. And the writer of Hebrews says, the one being in all creation who is perfect, who is unstained, who is separated from sinners, and yet who has been fully human and knows everything that you struggle with is the one being who can walk into heaven. And he's preparing you for what we'll read next. And he's going to show exactly what Jesus does in heaven on our behalf. But get it in your head straight. And that's what the writer of Hebrews wants to do for us here. If you had to elect anybody who is living, who can speak on our behalf before God, the answer would be Jesus. It's what it meant to the original audience, and that's what it means to us. Well, that's the end of our thoughts today. If you have questions about anything that we've talked about here or want to dig into that a little bit deeper, I'll stay up here uh, between now and our, our worship time together. But I appreciate you taking time, and I encourage you, open up the book of Hebrews and read it as it was meant to be read from the first word all the way through the end, and now you'll find yourself among a few other friends than you had before. So thanks for being here this morning.